All right, so basically, you know, this is going to be short presentation-wise, but hopefully the dialogue um, will carry out to something meaningful for everybody here. And I know everybody here I have something uh, to add to the conversation coming from their uh, perspective of life, their experience in life. So basically, you know, I was motivated to put this together um, by, you know, one of the guys that motivates me a lot, uh, C.T. Fletcher. I don't know if you guys know his story, but, you know, he's a power lifter, uh, you know, a champion weightlifter, and you can go on Netflix and watch his uh, seminar. But uh, he had this um, quote that he uh, put out there that's talking about, um, you know, it doesn't matter how much weight it is, it's going to get lifted. Um, it doesn't have a choice. And I think that's very metaphorical uh, for life. And we'll get into that in a second. All right, so last uh, presentation, you know, we had uh, Jabari Jackson, who's also on the line um, now, talking about preparing and paying for college graduation. Um, and he's on the line, and, and at the end, if you guys got further questions, I know there was some questions last time. Uh, we can uh, ask those questions uh, of, of Jabari, you know, and then we'll get uh, closer to answering some of the things that uh, people wanted to get out of the last uh, webinar because they left away from there hungry. But this time I'll, I'll quarterback this one, and uh, we're just going to run through a, a couple uh, charts. If you have any issues uh, seeing the charts that's up on the slide, just let me know. Uh, and the key discussion is going to be, um, you know, metaphorical. We'll use a lot of analogies this time, you know, for dead weight and the lifter, and then choices, and which of those has choices. And then also uh, C.T. Fletcher's quote, knowing when it's your set. Uh, right up here on the chart, you'll see, um, you know, a learning vignette. You know, I, I just recently, I've been watching the movie Ray for a long time. I like the story, and I like the character that his mom played. And she spoke about uh, becoming crippled. And she said to Ray, don't ever let nobody turn you into no cripple. And I, I thought that was uh, very ironic because, uh, you know, the definition of being crippled is basically to be wounded, um, whether it be mentally or physically. And then uh, it's to be partially unable to use what one has or it's to be totally unable to use what one has, okay? So why in the world will Ray's mom tell him not to let anybody turn him into no cripple when, you know, he didn't have eyesight? So um, I guess it, it comes down to uh, the fact that he didn't have eyesight, so that he wasn't crippled by just not having eyesight. You know, he had a lot of other things going for himself. And if you watch that movie or read his life story, you'll see that he used all of those things. Um, so that brings us to the, um, you know, the, the topic of being crippled or being a crippler. You know, so um, I'm going to stop it right there to see if anybody else has any input uh, to that thought. You know, what it means to be crippled or what it means to be a crippler. And then I'll talk a little bit about Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Vitruvian Man here. Any thoughts? Hey, guys, it's Dante. The, um, I like that analogy of being crippled, being, being crippled or being a crippler. It's like that, that negative Ned, like constantly doubting yourself. Like, it's a, it's a mindset, you know, and if you look at where we've come as a people, right now there's always a negative portrayal or a, you know, you can't do that, you can't do this. You know, there's always hurdles and obstacles in our way. And it's like, you know, well, I know I can do it, and I'm going to do it regardless of what anybody says, versus, you know, like, oh, you can't, you know, telling somebody they can't follow their dream or they can't achieve that goal. That's, you know, being a crippler.
This image of the Vitruvian man taken from Leonardo's sketches has become one of the most recognizable symbols of the Renaissance. But why? It's a simple pen and ink drawing, right? Wrong. Let's start to answer this question with a math problem. I know how to calculate the area of a circle. I take the value for pi and multiply it by the radius squared. I also know how to take the area of a square. I multiply the base by itself. But how can I take the area of a circle and create a square with an equal area? This is a problem often called squaring a circle that was first proposed in the ancient world. And like many ideas of the ancient world, it was given new life during the Renaissance. As it turns out, this problem is impossible to solve because of the nature of pi. But that's another story. Leonardo's sketch, which is influenced by the writings of the Roman architect Vitruvius, places a man firmly at the center of a circle and a square. Vitruvius claimed the navel is the center of the human body, and that if one takes a compass and places the fixed point on the navel, a circle can be drawn perfectly around the body. Additionally, Vitruvius recognized that arm span and height have a nearly perfect correspondence in the human body, thus placing the body perfectly inside a square as well. Leonardo used the ideas of Vitruvius to solve the problem of squaring a circle metaphorically using mankind as the area for both shapes. Leonardo wasn't just thinking about Vitruvius, though. There was an intellectual movement in Italy at the time called Neoplatonism. This movement took an old concept from the 4th century developed by Plato and Aristotle called the Great Chain of Being. This belief holds that the universe has a hierarchy resembling a chain, and that chain starts at the top with God then travels down through the angels, planets, stars, and all life forms before ending with demons and devils. Early in this philosophic movement, it was thought that mankind's place in this chain was exactly in the center. Because humans have a mortal body accompanied by an immortal soul, we divide the universe nicely in half. Around the time Leonardo sketched the Vitruvian man, however, a Neoplatonist named Pico della Mirandola had a different idea. He pried mankind off the chain and claimed that humans have a unique ability to take any position they want. Pico claimed that God desired a being capable of comprehending the beautiful and complicated universe he had created. This led to the creation of mankind, which he placed at the center of the universe with the ability to take whatever form he pleases. Mankind, according to Pico, could crawl down the chain and behave like an animal, or crawl up the chain and behave like a god. It's our choice. Okay, I'm going to stop it right there um, to see if there are any thoughts um, on, on that statement that was just that man can't kind of has a choice you know he can behave like an animal or he can behave like a god you know or he has illimitable abilities when it comes to life any thoughts on it you too aj if you got any Any thoughts out there on Vitruvian man? Give everybody a chance to go ahead and watch it. They might have watched the whole thing. We'll see. Okay, who we have out there on the line? Still here, Johnny Roberts. Okay, any thoughts on Vitruvian's man? Uh, the only thoughts that I would say is kind of like the choice. Um, just to add to that, I would just say I believe that 
our perception and our choices shape our environment. Absolutely. Our choices shape our environment, you know, and our perceptions as well. Um, and T.T. Fletcher had another uh, quote that uh, talks about um, the word impossible. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, Dane, uh, a darn thing that's impossible. As soon as you believe that anything is possible, then you have, you're halfway there. And I think that's very possible. Be- I'm sorry, that's very powerful because there are a lot of people who, you know, they, they kill their hopes, they kill their dreams before they even start. And uh, up on the screen here, I have another one that's close. It doesn't matter how much weight it is, it's going to get lifted. It doesn't have a choice. Now, that brings me back to the analogy of uh, the dead weight and the lifter. You know, in many instances in life, um, we allow ourselves to become the weight, and we allow industries and jobs and bosses to be the lifter. You know, as though we don't have any choices. We allow the other partner in a relationship to be the lifter, and we allow ourselves to be the weight, as though we don't have any choices. Now, all the while, they're getting stronger, they're growing, but we're just being tossed around. Any thoughts on that? And we got a shy bunch today. What you got, AJ? Uh, I'm going to stay on this chart until I get some thoughts, man. Somebody's got to have some thoughts on that. Yeah, give me a minute. I'm trying to pull it up. I've had to go to my second laptop. One of them is on doing updates, so. Okay. And it's not much to the slide. It's just a guy holding some weights. The thought is, are you the weight or are you the lifter? And and I'll I'll repeat what I just said. In many instances, whether it be the relationship that we have with our job or our boss, sometimes we allow the boss and the job to be the lifter and us to be the weight. While While they're getting stronger, we're just being tossed around. Or we allow the other person in some relationship to be the lifter, and we're just the weight being tossed around. And the quote by C.T. Fletcher is, it doesn't matter how much weight it is, it's going to get lifted. It doesn't have a choice. Which one are you, the weight or the lifter? That's the thought we're trying to get out here. Hey, guys, from from my perspective, uh, that's, uh, that's like the balance of life, like, there's instances where, you know, you're you're the lifter. You have to, you know, you've got responsibilities to yourself. You've got this weight. It's got to be lifted. Like you said, no matter how much weight it is, it's got to be lifted. And it's like, you know, as you grow and mature as an individual, you know, you const- you take on more weight. Like, that's just how our society is built. And it's like, you know, you've got to grow. You've got to get stronger. You've got to excel at it. And there's points in life where it's like, hey, it's too much weight or it's dead weight. And it's like, you know, either I got to get stronger to lift it or I don't need to be lifting this weight. I got to let that go. Absolutely. Knowing one's limitations. Mm -hmm. And also knowing what one brings to, you know, organizations, relationships, knowing what your role is. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent thought. Any others? I guess I would think that at any given time, as we're growing, we, we're we on both sides of it, and especially if you're in a scenario where you haven't learned how to overcome that, that weight one way or the other. Uh, I think we could be on both sides of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the the thing the thing to think about here is um, the fact that the weight doesn't have a choice in the situation. And you know um, that that you know provides segue into this next set of discussion um, quotes, so to speak. And I'll start with this quote. And I just want to know what the first thing that comes to your mind, um, each of you, if possible, um, when you see these quotes. Uh, the first quote comes from uh, well, our first two quotes come from Reverend Ike, and he says, uh, "How can you believe in a God in the sky and not believe in the God in you?" Then he goes on to say, "A person that understands how to use their mind." It's unfit to be a slave. What's the first thing that comes in your mind when you hear that, AJ? First thing that comes in my mind when I hear that is that you have to be uh, mentally prepared for anything. Okay. Yeah. Elaborate on it. How can you believe in a God in the sky and not believe in the God in you? Elaborate on that one. Uh, you um, believe in yourself. Okay. Any other thoughts? On that one, I would say, and it's kind of hard for me to, you know, re- relay this thought, but I look at it in a different light. I look at it when I think about the quote about God, I think about love. How can I love anybody else until I first learn to love myself? Absolutely true. And it works with God in the same way because he says, God says, I'm part of you. Okay. And before I go past this quote, I'm going to go back to the Vitruvian man in this slide and talking crippled. God is good. (laughs) You know, and, and, and I know it's some, folks out here who might have different gods than the one I serve, so I'm not going to go into that. But I'm going to go into the Vitruvian man, you know, squaring in the circumference of, of, of mankind. It basically solves um, a mathematical problem of perfection. You know, how a human being can fit into a square and how a human being can also explain the circumference of a circle. And that in of itself tells me that God has already done all that God needs to do for us if, of course, you're not crippled, and whether that be mentally or physically. Now, Ray Charles is a guy, for instance, you know, I, I talked about, you know, that movie, man, and also these are the true accounts of his life. He's a guy who was blind since he was 12 years old and still managed to become a millionaire, still managed to go all over the world, still managed to touch many people's hearts. Now, would it be safe to say that even though the guy was blind, he wasn't crippled at all. And that brings us to this next quote. First thing that comes to your mind, incredible change happens in your life when you decide to take control of what you do have power over instead of craving control of over what you do not have. Any thoughts on that one? First thing that comes to mind. That's a that's stay in your lane. That's you know, that when I see that, that's like there's certain things in life that I have no control over, and I can't I can't stress myself over them. Like those are like I can't do nothing about that. Keep on rolling. And there's things that I do you know directly affect that I do have ultimate control over, and those are the things that I you know I control. So it's like by if I'm building a building, I know I've got to set that foundation. I know I'm responsible for that. I control that. But I don't control, you know, weather conditions or anything else like that. So when I see that, that's what I think. It's like, hey, this is this is what's in my lane. This is what's in my sector. This is what I got control of. This is what I'm worried about. This is what I'm focused on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, um, you know, when, when I see this, um, I, I think about, you know, some of the things that, that have been happening over the past few years that's caused uh, our people to go out into the streets and protest and riot and so on, you know, um, and and it it makes me wonder, um, you know, if we truly understand what it is that we control or where our power uh, resides, you know, because um, 
you know, I, I don't, I don't want to digress too far or skip ahead, um, but, you know, Jay-Z put out a, a new album, um, and it's, the story of OJ is a, a really good song on there, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the end. But basically, um, you know, we have a lot of power, um, financial power, um, and we have con- total control over that, and we have control over the way that people um, treat us collectively if if we learn to harness that power and you know we can look at things at the micro level you know and say okay i i can control myself and i can do this but we also need to look at things at a collective level um and from a stance of um uh, of of our mentality our mental approach to things any other thoughts Kind of like if I got a bird in the hand, how they say a bird in the hand beats two in the bush, how can I have a bird in the hand and be starving looking at, you know, trying to get them two in the bush when I don't even use the one that I have? Yep, absolutely. We've got to learn to use what we have. You know, back to old Ray Charles, he didn't have eyesight, but he had ears, two arms, a brain, legs, a voice, you know, and charisma. And he could have focused on being blind or he could have focused on all those other things that he had. All right. Next quote, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Now, what, what does that one mean to any of you guys? Well, 10% of your life, you know, is what happens. 90% of it is, is how you react to what happens. Anybody else want to add on to that one? And I'm basically, you know, I don't want to preach to the choir. I'm just drawing out you guys' thoughts for our audience. You know, you, you got a, a bunch of gentlemen who are accomplished uh, on the line. And, you know, it's being recorded, and some kid somewhere, you know, is going to be able to gain multiple perspectives on, on these ideas from multiple men who have been places and done some things. You know, so if you got any thoughts or any insights that, you know, support these uh, these items, by all means, down. Hey, Gus, um, this is Jabari. I'm sorry, my, my kids are turned up, so I had to get it in a more secluded location. Okay. But uh, looking at all these quotes, um, as you bring them together, uh, one of the things you got to consider all the time is the locus of control. Um do you have a internal locus of control, or does the individual have an external locus of control? It's basic psychology stuff. But if if I have an internal locus of control, that means that I can affect the environment more than the environment can affect me. So if I have an internal locus of control, I believe that I have more to do with the outcome of what happens than then what happens has to do with how it affects me. If I have an external local self-control, it does not matter what I do, I will not have positive effects on the environment. So um, when we uh, mentor people or when we we communicate with people, it's good to identify um, how where a person where a person's locus of control is because we can easily uh, offend them. Each of these statements are all power statements. Um, yeah. A lot of uh, that require a level of faith. And when I say faith, I'm not saying faith as a religious sense of faith. Uh, I'm talking about faith in the process, uh, faith in the system, faith in the people operating in the system, and also the faith within yourself. So having faith in yourself is, is a good thing to have, but also um, having faith in the process, faith in the system, which is a lot of times when we're talking with, you know, the African-American male in America, he has a tendency to not have faith in the process, not have faith in the system, and it's, it's very, he's, he's more subject to an external locus of control than he is to an internal locus of control. Absolutely. And, um, 
I, I like that thought. You know, I like that thought, and, and I, I want you to keep going with it. Um, but, but I want to point out a, a thing too. You know, that comes back to um, you know the body. You know, that Petruvian man. And let's let's consider the African American community, the African American male. Let's focus on him as a body, a body of men, a, a group. You know, and is that group crippled without a system that works for them? Is the question. We're, so, we're both crippled, crippled, and there's. We, we can all sit here and have this discussion because we're all successful. We've been around the world and done things. There, and then you look at our youth. You look at those that everything around them is perceived in a negative light. Like all they see is darkness in their tunnel, and it's like it's hard for them to believe in something positive or see something positive when that's all they're subjected to. It's negative, 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 negative. You know, there is no, you know, the success story is the one off. He leaves that environment. He never comes back. Like, so I guess in a mind, in a sense, not to be the negative man, but there's, they're crippled by the system and then they're cripplers because that's what they accept. That's what they accept. <laughs> that's, that's that's powerful there. Now, now we're talking. You know. And it's like it, it's 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 weird. And you said uh, earlier, um, we were talking about. You said you spoke on Jay Z's four forty four, his album, right? A couple of webinars ago, we talked about leaders. Why we don't have any more leaders in the community because we're afraid of reprisal. You know. You know. It showed like. If you've seen I'm Not Your Negro, everybody that stepped up and was doing something, they freaking cut them down in their prime. You know, as soon as they yeah. start making great strides, they cut them down. And it's hard to look out across our people and see that. You know, we say, oh, a rapper needs to step You know, somebody needs to step up and say something. And it's like as soon as somebody steps up, we get behind the movement, we get crushed. It's, you know, I mean, it sucks to say that, but it's like it's a um, – it's there we go, here we go with another perceived negative point of view on the situation when it's like, well, when do we see somebody that, you know, rose up and freaking inspired and started a movement? You rarely get to see that. Like you don't you don't see that in our community. You you know, we can go through our history, we can go through look at a brief just look at our modern American history. Look at us, Marcus Garvey, Doctor King, Malcolm X, Even Murder like you look Every time somebody got up, they cut them down. And it's like, okay, how do we... Okay, I, 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 like, I like the thoughts that you're drawing out. Now Now we're talking, now we're warming up. And, you know, like, I, I've heard a, a continuing nuance of we don't get to see, we don't get to see, we don't get to see. You know, all right? And now let's go back to the original analogy, Ray Charles the blind man. All right? Now let's say his eyes was his way of seeing Okay, for some reason, that was taken away from him. Now, let's bring us back to the body of the African-American man. And now let's say media outlets, the television, the radio, the Internet are our way of seeing. Okay, we don't own those things. So we're never going to get to see the positive or something that's advantageous to us. So what do we have? What, what, what's left? What's left of that body? Well, to me, it's kind of like a magic trick, you know, when it comes to the media, when it comes to the things, because the eye is the window of the soul. So it's like a magic trick. If I get you to look into look into the right, the real magic is happening over in the left. If I get you to focus in on all of this negativity, then you're not fighting the fight where it needs to be fought. You know, we, we the thing about movements is – the way that they're conducted. Are we talking about the problem or are we mo moving toward a solution to the problem? Because I think that's the what slows down most movements is we, we do a lot of talking about the problem. We do a lot of promoting about what the problem is, but we don't really have solid solutions or not working enough toward more of the solutions than what the problem is. You know, absolutely. Can can we lay out a few here? I mean, we're recording. And, and me personally, I think one solution is mentorship. Each one teaching one. You know, and you can get one person, one young man, and help him. Anybody else know of any others? 
Well, one other thing, on, and, I, and I'll leave it alone, but just like when we're talking about some of the people that was cut down, we could look at that in two different ways. You know, we could say, okay, well, because they got cut down, I don't have the strength to uh, make any noise because I'm in fear for what might happen to me, while at the same time there's somebody else looking at it like some, that person gave their life for something that they believed in, so now I'm inspired. Yeah, it all absolutely. comes down to perception. Yeah, a- absolutely. You know, and um, y- you know, when it when it comes to that, you know, those jokers, um, you know, from our past, the the, the old enslaver, oppressor, and and the old uh, civil rights activist who did the best that he could or she could for what they had. You know, those are you know definitely. Um, what, what's the word uh, I'm looking for? They deserve for us to pay homage to them, you know, for what they did and what they did to push us forward to where we are now and how they paved the road for us. But the the truth of the fact of the matter is, is that those guys, are, you know, they're behind us and what's in front of us. How do we build new leaders, new youth, you know, that are going to carry the torch forward? And that brings us to this uh, next quote from Socrates, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old but on building the new. And that was um, very profound to me, you know, especially in uh, in the current position that I am in life, you know, whereas uh, I'm sort of, you know, at a, at a middle, middle of the road position uh, in, in my career, whereas I'm not the senior guy but I'm not the most junior guy. And then you, you have to contend. You have to contend with, with all of these old ways, you know, and you have to contend with the trajectory of things, of, of where things are going. And we have that in life as well. You know, there a lot of those people, I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Jim Crow was not a long time ago. There are people who are still alive and who are still teaching their children, um, you know, those messages from that era, from that era. So, you know, do we focus all of our energy on fighting those old heads that are out there pushing hate, or do we focus our energy on building stronger youth? You know, this is the question of the age. I, I think those are great questions. I, I, I think they're great questions, but I, I think we live uh, in, in both environments. Uh, not only are we addressing uh, the past, and we are also building the future. So as we address the past, it's we got to uh, be mindful that we understand uh, the different activities that uh, or the different actions that cause the past to become what the past is. Um, I believe our current um, generation, um, and I'm talking about us 40-year-olds and even um, the younger millennials, uh, we are avoiding uh, conflict, and by avoiding conflict, when I say we avoid the conflict, is that we begin to just to isolate people that we don't agree with, so they get a version of history, and then we get a version of history, and we go back and forth about it. As we move forward, uh, we are, as a consequence of that, moving forward, we're making ourselves irrelevant. The best example I can give you is this week I was talking to a to a white male about American history and genocide. This white male, about a 35-year-old white male, very good person. I have nothing negative to say about this person, but he lacks awareness of where is America, the United States as a nation, in historical relevance to nations around the world? Um, he believes that uh, in America we forget about things. Well, when there's no one left to remember, you can't forget about things. So if you look at overseas and you look at these genocide things overseas, uh, we have a tendency to look at uh, the actions, whether they be in Crimea, uh, the Ukraine, Russia, the Middle East. We have a tendency to, to be aloof and unaware of the consequences of, of our past actions. 
So we don't have a good understanding of our past. And now we're trying to build a future, um, even in foreign policy and in our uh, domestic policy, uh, without understanding the consequences of those decisions in the past. I, I, I know I went long uh, to, to lay that out for you. It's like we have to have a better understanding of the past because then we are able to measure action. And as we build models for the future, because we have to model behavior. We can't just say, I want you to be this way. No, you have to model the behavior so that the person can understand the different consequences of your current actions on the future. If you talk about Jay-Z or you talk about uh, Master P or a lot of these, uh, these these rappers who say things that the past generations don't agree with and we don't like their, their approach to speaking and we're saying that they're spoiling the youth, they're spoiling the youth. What if I told you there's a lot of people in America who have never said what we would call a curse word that are spoiling the youth a lot more than these younger guys. Let me tell you something. This slide that we have in front of us talks about what Jay Z or Master P have done. They built a new paradigm. Yes, they have. We spoil the youth by, by just telling you it's okay. Well, this is just the way stuff is, baby. Don't try to be successful, baby, because they're going to cut you down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's completely nuts, man. That last episode of um, uh, that last episode of the Carmichael's, um, it talks about that. So if you folks get a chance to watch that, won't well, watch it. But watch it, you know, with kids and provide that parental guidance. And, um, I mean, you said a lot of powerful things. Um, and, you know, I, I hate to be the type of person that hangs on words, but I do. And you, you said, you know, we should always strive to understand the past. And I think that's very healthy. Um, and what I think is unhealthy is when people place energy and effort into striving to change the past. You can't change it. You know, the past is the past. You should try to understand it. And you take that yeah. and focus energy into a Yeah, so with that, what's the consequences of hanging a man that's already dead? Absolutely. <laughs> you can't do it. You can't do it. But, but the funny part about it, what's the about dead weight, the funny part about it is that he'll still weigh the same if you tried to hoist him up on a rope. Whether he was alive or dead, you're still going to have to carry that weight and use that effort, but it's a moot point. And it's like I agree with what what you said, uh, Jack. Is those and it's just, it goes along with that other quote. Is I, I and forgive me if I screw this up, but it's um, those who don't know the past or don't understand the past are, are bound to repeat it. You know, yep. if we don't learn from prior lessons then if if looking at it from a strategic standpoint if it's a football game a basketball game anything or war if i'm using the same strategies and the same tactics and i don't have to change anything why am i not you know why am i going to do anything different i'm going to do the same thing because it's going to get me the same results you're still i'm going to still be successful and you're still going to be in the place that you are because you're not learning Yep. You're not paying attention to what, what it is that I'm using against you to keep you in that position. You're kind of like a dog chasing your tail. Yep, I think that's a perfect segue into this quote that's up on the board. Um, you know, not paying attention what people are using against us. Okay, and what is it that folks are using against us? And, and I think that's um, our, our lack of unity. And when you look at this chart, it says people take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness just because they're not on your road doesn't mean they've gotten lost and that comes from the Dalai Lama and this brings me back to um, the understanding that I had uh, years and years ago back in 2008 when uh, President Obama took office you know I was a young man and you know Muhammad Ali's quote uh, any man that thinks the same at 50 as he did at 25 just wastes his time well I don't 
think the same as I did back then. I was thinking back then, you know, here we are soldiering, fighting, doing all that we can. I've never been invited into the White House to talk to the president, but here you have a rapper, Jay-Z, again, who used to be a drug dealer. He's uh, doing over office visits and talking with the POTUS, and I, I was confused by that and kind of bothered by that. But then I looked at this quote, people take different roads, right? And our division as black people is, is something that's being used against us. And we don't have no time to judge folks because they made it in a different way from us. You know, we're playing catch up as is. And, and it goes back to that story of AJ, I'm sorry, of OJ. If you listen to the words, you know, it doesn't matter what you are, those old Jim Crow Racist segregation folks are always going to consider you still a nigger. I mean, I hate to use that word, but they're going to always see you that way. So why on earth will we continue on looking at one another saying, okay, you used to be a drug dealer. I'm better than you. Or I'm this or I'm that or the other. I'm better than you versus, you know what, you survived in the way that you knew how, you know, by using what you had and not being a cripple. And I survived in the way that I know how. We need to come together. Any thoughts on that? Well, like, like you said in the song, we're all, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're still, we're still subjugated and defined as that. And how do we, how do we take that positive picture? Like, how do we reach out and communicate to one another when, you know, there's so many, like, it's a, it's a blade, it's a hidden cat system right before our eyes. Like, we put that stigma, we label people based on what we see and what we know about them instead of, like you said, like, you know, why can't we just unite and come together? Like, you know, hey, I got this dope boy that, you know, done time, and I'm looking at him, you know, like, oh, I don't trust him, but that man's got business sense. If he was able to go out here and make all this money and the people came and got him, he had some business sense about him. He may have made some poor, I mean, he made some poor choices and whatnot, but at the end of the day, that man's got business smarts. That's something we're failing to see in him, you know. Like, we we don't portray we don't portray or depict ourselves in a manner to say, you know, well, let me look at the positive side of that. We never, and that goes back to what we're subjugated to. We're never, we're rarely shown anything positive. So, you know, if all of us, if all I see is something bad, then that's all I'm going to think. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. you know, and if you look at some of these uh, pharmaceutical companies, man, their ingredients are the same thing as what the dope man is pushing on mm -hmm. the corner. But we'll buy into that because they, you know, they say, "Well, this is good for you. This is good for you." Or well, here's another thing. So we had the big bubble burst in what 2008, right? So you have these people on Wall Street, you know, brokers stealing millions of dollars, and I think out of all of them, only maybe two or three of them did any time, any federal time at all. Meanwhile, JoJo, around the block, he goes to uh, a corner store and steals $300, you know, and now he has a criminal record. Now, oh, he had a weapon, so now we're going to give him a whole bunch of time, over $300, when what do we do with the people that stole millions? Yeah. We gave him more money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we gotta we gotta definitely uh, take a look at things and see, you know, where we've been crippled. So I I I tell you, um I'm, I'm I'm starting to get warmed up now. Um <laughs> I'm I'm really I'm really enjoying this this conversation. I think um uh one of so I think life is, is complicated. I believe life is complex. I believe uh, life requires several different perspectives uh, in order to be successful. So I mean, if you refer to, like, the black man in America uh, as a body, you know, we, have to, we have to do a better job of fighting diseases within the body. Oh, absolutely. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, 
And our normal method is, if we have a disease within the body, I'm just saying, we're using some archaic methods. We're amputating one another. Um, as opposed to uh, prescribing the, the, the right activity to correct the behavior. You notice I didn't say medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said the proper activity uh, for correcting the behavior. And I think a, a, a person can be reached at different points in their life. They just have less utility the older they are. So if, if you're 70 years old and you decide to slow down and change your ways and all of that stuff, Man, you're, 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 you're very good for a motivational rah-rah speech, but you're not much as far as useful as far as getting, uh, younger folks who have, uh, a life ahead of them to, to begin to invest in themselves. So as, as, as a body of, of, of black men or, or, or men in general, cause I, I am not to, to say, um, I don't like another ethnic group or anything like that. I'm just saying that being a black man for almost 40 years, I know how it is to be a black man in America. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm the same way, you know. It's not that I don't like a different ethnic group, but, you know, if everything is important, then nothing is. And right now it's important that we put this on ourselves. If you can't help yourself, you can't help anybody else. And, I say that. Amen. I like the analogy that you use, you know, we got to start to uh, look at things that are affecting us, you know, diseases within the body and that are making us sick, you know, and that goes back to that uh, crippling thing that was spoken about. We don't let anybody turn into no crippling. And what is a crippling as a body? That's a question you really need to remember this all. Oh yeah. So I, I think you know one of the things that 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 uh, cripples us is I'm not even talking about the the, the long term past. I kind of talked about our lack of understanding of the past, but we have a lack of understanding of, of our personal past. That's crippling us. Because if if I was a to to allow my personal past to affect my future. I'm telling you, man, I wouldn't make it. I, I just wouldn't. So, yeah, that's so to, true. If you go to high school, it, it, it depends on where you met Jabari Jackson in his life. If you went to high school with Jabari Jackson, you, you the current Jabari Jackson, you have no idea that they're different people. It's the same person, but it's a developed life. Right. So the, average, the average person goes through high school in how many years? Four? Okay, they go to high school in four years. Jabari Jackson went that went through high school in five. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and if, and if you would talk to me now, you would say a person because this this is how simple uh, people are. If 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 being um, successful in your education or being successful in life is totally just a intellectual challenge. Those that don't achieve high school success or whatever success is totally based off intellect. I would prove that form of thinking wrong because I've always had the intellectual capacity to perform in any environment, but there were other factors in my environment that was affecting my ability to be disciplined in that environment. So we, we are so quick to destroy somebody before they can even take flight. Yep. Um, and we, talk, we talk about positivity. It's like, are we positively uh, demonstrating the proper example towards negativity? That's when, a good question. No, I mean, not, not at all. Not, not, even remote, not even remotely close. Just like you said, we're so quick to tear each other down. Or look at you know look at what affects us without taking the time to step back and assess the situation and develop an informed opinion on it or under you know like I said understanding where we come from understanding our you know understanding our short history like hey you know I'm not you know I turned 35 this year I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago I have a totally different outlook on life you know now than I had then 
you know, and things things change. But we like said that we they paint that negative. There's the negative picture is always in front of us, and it's like you said, like you said, it's like a magic trick. I'm gonna get you to look left, but the magic has happened over here on the right. We're not disciplined or focused enough as a people to see that. Right, and and, and it takes um, it, it takes small steps, and you got to be long term as you think through things. I hear this a lot of times when I'm out and about. I I, I hear um, I hear it and I see it on the media and all that stuff about how the black man is under siege and how the black man is under attack and all of that stuff. And I'm afraid to tell my my little boy this. I'm afraid to tell my little boy that and all of that stuff. Uh, I'm raising four black men. I got four boys in my house that I'm raising. My fear is not um, the... Uh, not just the environment, but my fear is more that goes back to that locus of control. My fear is, am I doing the proper things that are going to influence uh, the way that they think, the way that they can encounter and interact in the environment? Because if, if, if I don't do that, if I don't support, for instance, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm going to bring it up because we kind of we kind of tiptoed around this, Colin Kaepernick. Yep. Um, I just watched so about that. If if so if 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 I have a negative opinion towards Colin Kaepernick or if I have a positive opinion towards uh Colin Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick's decision has affected my four boys. Period. It allowed me to have very open eyes to the level of understanding of what's going on in America. Mm -hmm. A wide open. I was in a bubble, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was to have a difference of opinion and not be uh, blackballed for it. Yep, now that's, so, that's something uh, that, that we need to uh, be very cognizant of. You know, it goes back to that uh, weightlifting mentality. I'm a, as we come on certain topics, I'm going to bounce back to certain slides. Now, I asked the question earlier, you know, in this analogy, when C.T. Fletcher says it doesn't matter how much weight it is, it's going to get lifted. You know, there's two, there are two characters in the picture. There's the dead weight that's being tossed around, and there's the lifter who's better in himself by tossing the weight around. The weight has no choice. It has no sense. But the lifter has all the choice. Now, in Kaepernick's case, he made it apparent that the average American We're the weight that makes the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, and we just get tossed around. But the minute you start sometimes and the thing is, it goes back to perception because Marshawn Lynch said something real. You know, I like his perception of what Colin uh, Kaepernick did. He said, if he's just expressing a problem, you know, you have to be racist to have a problem with the way that he's ex expressing a problem that really does exist in America. We're not focused in on a problem. We're, we're focused in on his his manner of protest. You know, because if you look at it, we have a lot of supposedly freedoms in America. If you take the a Ku Klux Klan, could have a Ku Klux Klan rally with police protection, and nobody's going to, it's not going to be in the news for the next year about them being racist, but Colin Kaepernick takes the knee, you know, and he's the worst person in the world. Now, it, this shouldn't be surprising to us. If, if we had an understanding of just history in America, this should not be surprising to us. No. If if if, if the the general response toward Kaepernick is surprising to you, I'm telling you, you got to relook at the way you look at. Yep. <laughs> and I'm I'm gonna say something. You know, I'm gonna say something. If it's a thought, it's an analogy. Now let let's think about the Constitution, right? And think about the Constitution as a million dollars in the bank. That's for everybody. 
everybody. Now imagine a black joke off the street going to the bank and saying, hey, this Constitution is put in for me. I need to withdraw a few dollars. Mm-hmm. They're not having that. They're not having that. They, the power to be is not is not having that. It's, oh it's no! Just, oh no! <laughs> it's just it's the way it's the way it's not. And it's the, on the Kaepernick thing, my um, growing up, my I worked in the ball I worked in the ballpark during the summer at a concession stand, like selling um, drinks and stuff like that. And you know we walk around and sell hot dogs and stuff, right? And I can remember when the national anthem is played or whatever. You know they ask everybody to stand. I remember seeing you know World War Two Korean War vet. But they had on sitting down. They didn't budge, and nobody said a word. Nobody had anything to say to them. Nothing. I'm like, I, you know, I, when you brought that up, I thought back to that, and I was like, I remember these old guys didn't sing. You know, they didn't. They just sat there, and they were silent, and you know, everybody stood, put their hand over their heart, and then it was that, you know, every and everything went on. Nobody looked at them any different, or nobody expressed any indifference towards what those guys did. Well, like you said, Kaepernick takes a knee and freaking, you know, everybody loses their mind. But there's no law, there's no law written in any U.S. code anywhere that says you have to stand or freaking any of that. That's just, that's all completely voluntary. And the system is set up that way. Like, you know, as long as you follow the status quo, they're going to give you what they think you deserve. Or, you know, they're going to, you, you're, you're going along with the rest of the sheep. But the moment you're, the moment you step away from that, now there's a problem. You know, now, yeah. now it's, now it's something wrong with you. That's going to call me. Yeah, and in fact, it's just the opposite of what you said. There is a law mm-hmm. in the Constitution that says you don't have to. <laughs> but there's no law that says you do have to. <laughs> hey, you know what? I, I, I'll say this. You know, I'm just as guilty. You know, we, we it, when we talk about resolving the problem, I'm just as guilty by not doing enough to solve the problem than I am to even be thinking about it. I'll give you an example of what I'm, what I'm, the point I'm trying to reach. Um, we learn in school, we'll learn about, you know, uh, American Indian history. We'll learn about, you know, the, you know the, the Nazis. We'll learn about all of these, you know, different cultures and stuff like that. Black history, we might get a month. And when we talk about black history, what does it always stem from? They always talk about our time in slavery, but never our time before that. They don't talk about the inventors. They don't talk about the kings. They don't talk about any of that, right? But yet I pay taxes for my kid to education. So, uh, But uh, I'm not effectively changing something I know to be wrong. Right. I'm not, uh, so I'm, I'm not, you know, you know, knocking anything, you know, that you just said. Um, when we start talking about like the body of America, um, just, just our country, there are more people that were educated and ignorant towards the contribution of other ethnic groups, and there are people that are educated in the contribution. Um, so we got to really understand them. Don't mean that you got to agree with them or, or agree with us. It's just that we have to seek understanding through how we interact and relate with one another. My big thing about, um, about history and contributions and stuff, uh, having a month is good. I my dream is that uh, you know it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but my dream is that we as a, as a nation of people have a unique understanding of all the contributions of our people. That all of the American blacks that have contributed to American society are celebrated throughout the year as we start to talk about whatever it is, whether it's exploration, we celebrate those blacks that have something to do with exploration, whether it's uh, the modernization of our road network, that we celebrate those blacks that had something to do with that, whether it's the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the settlement of what we call the American West, that we just recognize those people 
simultaneously. Um, because a lot of times when you go to a a um, you go to a, uh, a a Black History event, um, we always think it's good to have some good old black person speak about black contributions. I want to see if we, if I go to a black history event, we got competent white people that can speak about black contributions. It should not be just, just us um, educating um, them on something that they're just interested in. So as a people, we got to put ourselves in position to where we can remember things. Right. Because um, like because right now, we man, we'll forget Tuesday. On Tuesday. What's today? What was yesterday? I forgot already. <laughs> we ain't joking, man. Yeah, we're coming right. up on just over an hour, so I like to keep the recording short, uh, short so we can keep on going. But on this last chart here, you know, we always acknowledge um, some uh, quarterly accomplishments or some individuals. And, hey, I just wanted to put this up here because it's a milestone um, in both myself and Jabari's um, lives um, and where we came from. You know, that's the old picture of us from back in 2003 after we came from Iraq. Um, both of us just uh, close. God has been good. But I'll be a, a fool to tell you that it's going to be easy. You have to persevere and you have to use everything you got. Just like we've been talking about uh, throughout this presentation, it took literally everything. That that means phoning a friend. That means, uh, you know, leaning on your spouse to help you out. That means, you know, asking your kids to sacrifice some time. It took literally everything to to accomplish this. It took it took losing sleep, you know, and, and and you know I just can't even think of everything that it took uh, for me. And I know Jack, he can speak to what it took for him. But I'll tell you, it's been 11 years straight for me, uh, one class at a time, uh, staying up to two and three in the morning and just persevering through it all. And uh, next Saturday I'll walk across the stage uh, with, with a master's in GIS and, and landscape architecture. And will I stop there? Who knows? You know, um, but but uh, you know, it's a milestone, and I just want to share that with you guys. And, and Jack, you can talk more about uh, about your your journey. Man, you put me on the spot, man. <laughs> you put me, <laughs> choice, man. Put me on the spot. That's where you get the truth. Get <laughs> <laughs> water the um, red. <laughs> Um, I, I think the journey for me has has forced me to reflect on some things that I refuse to reflect on because they were painful. Um, it forced me to reflect on some things that I refuse uh, to reflect on because the, the, the outcome to reflecting on it uh, did not uh, always shed positive light on myself or other uh, or other people around me. But it was um, an awakening and awareness, and, it, and sometimes, you, for me, I had to repurpose my mission um, in life. So, and everybody has a, a different reason. So, if, 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 if your job is to pursue education, uh, so you can have a credential, I, they can leave the credential where they had it at. What I've learned. Um, over the course of studying for uh, my master's degree, I've, I've learned that you know leadership is about people. I've always knew that, but I understand it in a totally different way now. And um, so, like moving forward is like, how do I really empower people? Um, I've learned to empower people by being positive um, by uh, letting them know that it's all right to invest, knowing that, like as Gus was saying, it's a it's a it's a family thing. It involves family, it involves connections with a lot of different people, and also it, it involves emotional toughness, man. And when I say emotional toughness, um, if you're trying to get better at anything you're going to be challenged emotionally. And some of the things that you think are emotionally right, you're wrong. 
Um, and and also, um, the, the last comment I'll make is I'm going to always be a champion for encouraging folks to pursue their dreams, you know, no matter what it is. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, man. Um, and because, you know, pursuing your dreams, you know, that's going to be the key to your happiness. And I, I will say that education is the key to whatever it is that you want as long as it's realistic. And the reason why I say that is because, um, you know, it doesn't matter what, you're still going to be a, a black person in this country in the current state of the body of the African American. Uh, in this country, you know, and we've come a long ways and have a whole lot more to go, but education is not going to solve that unless, you know, you're using it to put yourself in a position to help to solve it, you know, but the education itself doesn't just uh, snap of a finger. You walk across the stage, you've been uh, conferred some degree. Now suddenly you're different. No, it's not going to work like that. It'll put you in a position to help move things forward. But it'll also put you in a position to do those things that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But okay. I'll, I'll close this to the board with that. But you guys feel free to stay on the line.